Okay, uh, welcome to the uh, co-hosted webinar from the International Accounting Standards Board, IASB and CFRA today on financial reporting issues where your opinion counts. So we really seek investors' perspective and feedback and would like to, to hear from you uh, with questions and so on as we go through the, the webinar. My name is Giles Flower. I'm the Global Head of Sales at CFRA. Um, I'm going to be the moderator today. I'd like to introduce two main speakers to you. That's going to be Zach Garst from the I, I, IFRA, um, ISB and Zach Zengian, a senior analyst at CFRA. So Zach um, has joined the, the board in the last year, in the middle of last year. Prior to that, he spent many years as at CFRA themselves as president and heading up our research team. Uh, and prior to that, Zach was at uh, Hedge Fund Paulson & Co, where he had up the, headed up the financial team sector space there for four years from 2009 to 2013. Uh, Zhen Deng is a senior analyst at CFRA. She had, uh, works closely within our bespoke research and is one of our, our key accounting experts at CFRA. Um, has been with us for many years. And prior to, to working with us, Jen was working uh, as a the US accounting expert at UBS. So as for the uh, agenda today, I will give a very quick introduction to, to CFRA for anyone who's less familiar with us. And then I will hand over to Zach uh, for the, the consultation uh, introduction and then into more details into the consultation and, and into the topics in more detail. After that, we'll hand, hand back to Jen and we'll look at uh, the CFRA's perspective on the consultation views with a specific focus on cash flows, intangible assets and inventory and the cost of sales. And then once we've uh, heard from both sides, we will then hand it over to the audience and look, look for questions to come through. Uh, anything you've got there. So we'll go through a Q full Q&A session. So hopefully you can see a drop down panel on the GoToWebinar uh, as you've logged in. There's a chat function there. So please type in any questions you have. Um, we will then we'll look, attempt to get through them at the end of the, uh, to get to the Q&A session. Might not get to them all. So we'll certainly answer questions that we don't get to after the web webinar has actually finished. But please drop questions th in uh, as, as, we, as we're talking now uh, and um, we will hopefully get to them. As I say, it's your time to give your perspective and feedback and we really much would appreciate that to, to questions to come through. Okay. As for a, a background, um, some people on the call will be already clients and familiar with who CFRA are and what we do. There are obviously other people who are less familiar with what we, we have to offer. So we have two sides, key sides of the business at CFRA. Uh, the forensic accounting business, which was founded 25 years ago, the largest global forensic accounting firm around, uh, which essentially looks after our institutional client base. Uh, we also, then purchased the S&P equity business about five years ago, which now provides us with fundamental equity research. Uh, where we're covering over 1600 companies globally. It's also that the coverage also includes ETF research, ETF data, mutual fund research and data as well. Uh, so the coverage we have certainly on the stock side of things is as well as on, on the fund side will be uh, buy sell hold recommendations uh, on all these companies uh, and funds. Um, uh, what's kind of key to what we, we offer here is the fact that we are, CFRA is a firm, is totally independent. We do not run any money. We have no conflicts of interest. Um, we have over 75 analysts globally, plus we've got complete global coverage. Um, we can jump up a couple of slides or one slide. Yeah. Um, what we are focusing on today will be our forensic accounting service and on the offering we have. Um, I will give you a big summary on the, the offering and obviously the coverage all we're talking through is from our forensic accounting analysts. We are essentially looking to highlight and find companies we think are public companies we think are masking business deterioration through aggressive or creative accounting. We find enough issues and concerns in given companies will flag them as socks to either avoid for risk mitigation perspective or to directly short if he has those means as a, uh, as a long short fund. So it'll be individual stock analysis. We do have a legal product as well. It looks at legal regulatory issues where we flag uh, issues and positive elements on a positive or the, or the long positive or the negative side 
Uh, we also have quantitative and bespoke analysis as well as expert training we can uh, provide to, to give people insight how we identify these issues. So that's a quick insight on CFRA. Now I'll hand it over to Zach from his perspective on the consultation. Over to you, Zach. Thanks, Giles. Um, I'd like to add my thanks to everyone for joining on behalf of the IFRS Foundation. Uh, I'm Zach Gast, as Giles said. I'm wearing my relatively new hat as a member of the International Accounting Standards Board, uh, where I serve as an investor representative from the Americas. I'm joined today by the board's investor engagement team, as well as some of our technical experts who may be able to chime in on any technical questions you have. Uh, for today's presentations, I should caveat that any comments and opinions we provide are solely our own and don't represent the views of the board as a whole. So with that, uh, we're here today to discuss and get your initial feedback on the board's five-year agenda consultation, which will set the broad outlines for the board's activities from 2022 to 2026. Uh, I'll quickly review the consultation itself, uh, the areas we're looking for feedback on, as well as where you can get more information and provide your feedback. That last piece is really the most essential part of this process. The board works extremely hard to integrate investors' feedback into its work plan and decisions, but one of the most difficult parts of that effort uh, is actually obtaining investor feedback. So we really want to urge you to follow up with us if you have any questions and to make your opinion known. So on to some background for the consultation. At the end of March, we published our request for information. You should have received a copy of that document prior to this call, uh, and we'll be working to gather feedback until the 27th of September before we spend approximately nine months weighing that feedback and making a final decision on our five-year work plan. So the consultation itself is framed around three key questions. First, what is your view on the correct strategic direction and balance of the board's activities? And for many investors, this focus tends to be on new IFRS standards and amendments to existing IFRS standards. Within that area, we have two additional areas. We ask what the criteria should be for assessing the priority of financial reporting issues. And finally, we ask directly which financial reporting issues you believe should be prioritized in the board's work plan. So digging a little bit deeper into that first question, we'd like to know whether we're spending time on the right activities and whether there are activities we're missing from our work plan. The key here is that we decide to increase time spent in one activity. We'll need to find that time by reducing effort somewhere else, uh, unless you'd like to give us some more funding, in which case we'd be happy to have a discussion after the call. So. If we go ahead, you'll see that the board spends most of its time and resources in standard setting activities, maintenance and consistent application. A uh, good example of this is the implementation committee for IFRS, uh, which does technical work on very narrow questions, and stakeholder engagement as the third area. In the interest of time today, I won't go through each of these areas, but I did want to focus on three that are typically higher priority for investors. Uh, as always, if you have questions about the other areas, do reach out and we'll be happy to go into more detail. So not surprisingly, we're going to start with standard setting for the Accounting Standards Board, uh, which it's important to note includes both new projects, which we'll address later in this presentation, as well as the post-implementation reviews of prior standards. Uh, right now, we're in the midst of two such reviews. IFRS 10 to 12, as well as the classification and measurement requirements of IFRS 9, which covers financial instruments. But we will have large reviews ahead for some of the major standards that were passed over the five, last five years. So if you think about revenue, leases, um, some more portions of IFRS 9, and in particular, credit loss accounting, uh, are things that are all coming up on the agenda. The next key area, and one of my particular interests, is digital financial reporting. Historically, this has mostly meant the development and maintenance of the IFRX, IFRS taxonomy, which is used in XBRL reporting. What is clear, at least to me, is that the world of technology and the amount of information that the investor community can absorb has changed dramatically. 
Uh, I personally would love to see us explore ways that technology can enhance financial reporting. For example, is there room for an additional layer of disclosure that's digital only? Are there areas where granular disclosures would be helpful to investors without being overly burdensome to companies? Things like capital structure disclosures that provide limited data on instruments outstanding at the end of a period. What's certain is that technology is gonna continue to progress over the next five years. And if the technology in investment research is moving as quickly as it is today, um, I would question whether we can afford to not keep up as accounting standard setters. Finally, we come to our last activity, which is stakeholder engagement. Um, for this agenda consultation, we're working through comment letters and online survey or focus group sessions. Um, the question for you is, there more we can do? Should we be doing something differently? Um, we're always looking to hone the ways we reach out, in particular to investors, to make sure their feedback comes in and we understand what information they're looking for from companies um, that could be provided differently or we could work on in a different way. Okay, so if we move along, the next key question is how to weigh the different financial reporting issues that we're considering addressing. What we have are seven criteria. The importance of matters to investors is first, uh, whether there's a deficiency in current reporting that we're trying to solve, the type of companies affected and jurisdictions where the matter is more prevalent, uh, how per pervasive the matter is, how the project might intersect with other projects and the complexity and feasibility of the potential project. And lastly, getting back to that most important part is our internal capacity. Um, there's only so much we can take on, so we try to be selective and uh, pick projects where we can accomplish something and improve reporting to investors. So the key question for all our stakeholders, but in particular investors is, do these criteria work for you? Uh, other key criteria we've missed that we should be integrating into our analysis. Um, and that should be something you can provide input on uh, through the process. And then we move along to the financial reporting issues that the board could potentially address. The key point we wanna make here is that with everything already underway, we've taken a look at our capacity and understand that there's only room for two to three large projects or four to five medium projects or a slightly larger number of small projects. Um, that's essentially all the capacity we have. And so we need to be careful in prioritizing what are the things that are most important. And so we're really looking for a spectrum of feedback from investors in particular. Not only what are the most important things to you, but what are the least important? What are the things we can and should skip over from your perspective? Now, before I go and start reviewing the list of projects contained in the RFI, uh, I should warn you that these 22 projects are only the projects that have surfaced in our exploratory work. We spent about a year talking to people about what could or should be included. Um, or things that have come up over the last four or five years. So as we work through our current work plan, as always, you find things where people say this should be fixed. And so we've tried to bring these things to the forefront uh, in putting together the list of 22 projects. Um, but your feedback on any of or all of the 22 are important. Um, but as important, if there's something missing, if there's something that should be on here, tell us and tell us why it should be on there because all of that can be integrated as we move forward. And with that, we arrive at our project list, which we have summarized here on one slide. Um, and I'm gonna caveat my descriptions for each of these by saying that we have a fantastic technical staff who wrote wonderful, concise descriptions, which are in the document that was sent out. And I'm about to truly massacre um, each of these projects with an extremely short description that's devoid of most of the necessary nuance. Um, so I wanna to apologize to them and let you know there, there are further details. We're happy to handle that in the Q&A and in the document itself. So let's begin with borrowing costs, which is the first on the list. Uh, you'll notice these are in alphabetical order uh, so that we don't uh, 
to try and say that there's a priority on one or the other. So with borrowing costs, the intent of the project is to review an older accounting standard to clarify what counts as a borrowing cost and what gets capitalized versus expensed in the current period. Um, the next is climate related risks. This is a project that focuses on how climate risks affect the financial statements as they exist currently, particularly assets and liabilities on the balance sheet. And there are a variety of project scopes that we could pursue, presentation requirements, impairment of assets for things like obsolescence that could be caused by climate. Um, but there are just a range of activities that we could get involved in here. Um, next up on the list is commodity transactions. Uh, and this would involve developing requirements for either common types of commodity tractions or a broader range of non-financial asset transactions. So the first would be something like a commodity loan. The second would be um, a broader range of assets like cryptocurrencies, um, which companies often hold for investment rather than for um, similar to fin financial instruments, but that can't be included in that category. So that next category of cryptocurrencies and related transactions, um, I'm sure you've all heard of Bitcoin. Uh, it turns out that under IFRS standards and US GAAP, these are intangible assets measured at amortized cost with impairments recognized in the P&L. And so we're looking feed for feedback on how important these assets are or should be in our agenda. And if we do address them, how should we do that? Should it be on um, their classification? Should it be in some other way? There's a lot of directions we could go there. Um, the next one is discontinued operations. This has traditionally been a single line item presentation with a number of application and measurement questions. And so it's come up quite frequently on agenda consultations. Um, and we've just never gotten it onto the agenda. So continue to bring that back to investors and ask how important it is. Uh, discount rates is the next project. Um, discount rates used in IFRS accounting standards have been developed to match the items being discounted. Um, but some of these methods that we've come up with have changed over time. Um, resulting in what we would call a hodgepodge of rates just because they've accumulated over a period of 20 years. Um, and it's been suggested that the board could review all of those discount rates to make them more comparable and consistent across uh, different standards. Next, we have employee benefits, um, in particular, the discount rates on employment benefits. The existing requirements are also less effective in handling some of the hybrid benefit plans as we move from defined benefit to things that look more like defined contribution plans, but aren't quite there. And so this would address that void between defined benefit and defined contribution. Uh, expenses, and this specifically refers to inventory and cost of sales. Uh, here we would take a look at cost of goods sold, cost of sales, inventory, and would work to harmonize practice across industries. This would look very similar to the revenue project, uh, IFRS 15, except it would play out sort of one layer or one step down on the P&L. Foreign currencies, uh, next item. Again, we could explore a range of issues here from the factors used to determine a company's fun functional currency to how to treat long-term payables and receivables when a currency is volatile and thinly traded. Um, going concern is one that came up quite a lot over the last 15 months. Um, here, we can improve the requirements around when a company is determined not to be a going concern. Um, we could also talk about the disclosures that should occur when a company is approaching that point or when they've determined that they're not a going concern. And finally, there actually is no basis of accounting for a company that is not a going concern. Uh, so that, that could be addressed as well. Um, government grants are another one that's come up a lot with COVID. Um, currently, the standard features the matching principle, um, which a lot of us learned 15 or 20 years ago uh, in school around accounting, but that concept's actually been removed from the conceptual framework. 
And there are a number of accounting policy choices that make understanding grants more difficult for investors. Um, companies can choose different ways to apply it, so it's not as standardized as you might expect. Um, income taxes are another area where there's just a number of things people have brought up. Um, the balance sheet approach on deferred taxes, there's a lack of disclosure on tax structures that affect the effective tax rate um, and any risks that might occur with those. And so we could do everything from engage in educational activities to try to design improved disclosures, or we could do a comprehensive re review of income tax accounting. Um, inflation, there is now an accounting standard for hyperinflationary economies uh, that differs from typical accounting. And some parties have suggested that could be extended to high inflation economies, while others have suggested that we should go back and redo the hyperinflationary accounting to be more in line with US GAAP, uh, meaning to be prospective rather than retrospective was the key aspect. Um, intangible assets. So this is quite a broad area and I'll probably spend a little bit more time here, um, more being a relative term. Um, because there's what we like to call a diversity of opinion among uh, within the accounting community on what we could do around intangible assets. Um, covering the high points, some assets are currently considered intangible assets like cryptocurrencies or emission rights that are viewed differently in the market. And the generation of intangible assets internally is also quite limited, which some parties would like to loosen. And those restrictions mean that companies that grow organically can look different than those that grow through acquisition. And it would seek to make them more similar. Uh, in terms of the remedies for all these issues, we could start with disclosures. Um, it's been suggested that we could fair value intangible assets through the P&L each period. Um, some of these projects could be very large and very complex. So we'd be very interested in hearing from users what their perspective on the intangible assets that appear on the balance sheet, whether they're purchased or internally generated, or whether the ones, or about the ones that do not appear on the balance sheet and profit and loss statement. Um, the next area is interim financial reporting. These are the quarterly and semester reports that we all get and spend our time on during earnings season. Um, the accounting guidance that handles interim reporting can be silent on which disclosures need to be updated on an interim basis and which can be handled annually. Uh, in particular, investors tend to feel that more should be provided in the interim statements. Negative interest rates is the next one. Um, we rely on accounting quite a bit on discounting, um, just as we do in investing. And when interest rates go negative, as they have recently, um, some of the answers we arrive at when we discount stop making a lot of sense. So it's been suggested that maybe we should revisit some of those and put in place um, actual solutions for what happens when interest rates go negative. Um, Next area would be operating segments. Uh, some of you may know that the FASB is looking at operating segments right now and working on developing increased disclosure requirements. So most of the suggestions that we've gotten today would take our work in the same general direction, although the specific disclosure requirements might differ. Uh, other comprehensive income, uh, again here, we would consider where gains and losses in AOCI should be recycled and recognized in the P&L and do that on a more systematic basis. Again, it's an area that's developed over time. And as we get to the last few, the pollution pricing mechanisms, um, we've researched this for quite some time, uh, things like cap and trade and how you could account for it previously. And we could resume that work. It's likely to be a large project though. Uh, the next one is separate financial statements. Uh, as you may know, in some jurisdictions, companies are required to present separate financial statements in addition to the consolidated financial statement. For example, this might be the parent or a joint venture. Uh, the suggested projects here would deal with some of the technical areas around how 
elements of those financial statements are presented, particularly when there are transactions between the consolidated entity and the separate company that's presenting a financial statement. Um, and then the last couple, the statement of cash flows. Um, this is likely one of the more suggested projects over time. Uh, it's another one that's been out there a while. And it's got a number of facets that could be addressed. And investors tend to request things like a direct cash flow statement uh, or better organization of items within the statement. A uh, good example is uh, you could separate out CapEx from financial investing on the investing section of the cash flow statement, or you could have better disclosure of non-cash transactions that can distort some of the free cash flow analyses we do. And then the last one is variable and contingent consideration. Um, this is an area that raises questions about both initial measurement as well as how changes in that measurement should be recognized. Uh, so it's one that's been on the agenda for a while uh, and we simply couldn't start. So reassessing whether that remains a priority for investors is key. Okay, so one more reminder, this list is not exhaustive. Um, we do welcome additional suggestions if there are areas that we should cover. Uh, and before I hand over to Jen for CFRA's view, uh, which I know you're all excited to hear, I wanted to point out that there are a number of materials that go beyond the very cursory review I was able to get through. And we've hyperlinked those so you can find those materials and where you can respond. We're definitely here, eager to hear your opinion um, and answer any questions you have. So do reach out when you can. That I'll hand it over to you, Jen. Thank you, Zach. I'm happy to share some of our thoughts at CFRA on three of the potential projects, the cash flow statement, intangible assets, and cost of sales. We hope the cash flow statement and the related matters will be among the projects the board will add to its agenda. We'd like to see enhanced disclosure of the effective receivables or payables financing arrangements. We think specific guidance is needed that requires companies to disclose the amount of the cash flow benefit and where on the cash flow statement and the balance sheet is the related amount presented. In addition, a roll forward should be required um, to avoid any confusion between the amount factored during the period and the ending balance. Um, the second improvement we'd like to see is a non-GAAP reconciliation type of disclosure for free cash flow or other similar cash flow measures. When companies define their own financial measures, we often have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what items have been adjusted compared with the relevant GAAP measure and whether those adjustments are reasonable. A reconciliation schedule would be a tremendous help for us to make the assessment. If a company changes the calculation, prior periods should be restated and the effect should be prominently displayed along with the statement for why the change is made. The third improvement we'd like to see is the presentation of interest payments. We support eliminating one of the presentation alternatives. If the board moves to require a financing cash flow classification as part of another project, then we believe it is important to require interest payments to be presented as a separate line item to facilitate comparison with U.S. GAAP companies. The fourth movement, uh, the, the fourth improvement may be bigger in scope. We like, uh, we'd like to see information that reconciles balance sheet changes with the cash flow statement. We envision a matrix type of disclosure that clearly identifies non-cash movements as well as one-off um, one effects such as acquisitions, discontinued OBS or restructuring activities separately from the ongoing inflows and outflows. Our last comment on the cash flow statement is a wish list from our financials team. Um, the next slide, please. Um, they'd like to see separate line items for cash interest paid and cash interest received to better understand the effect of non-cash sources of income or expenses. These are more subject to management discretion. In addition, they'd like to see gross presentation of changes in investments by major asset types, such as securities versus loans or other. 
that is purchases and proceeds presented separately by asset type. Furthermore, they would like to see, and this can be in the footnote rather than on the face of the cash flow statement, this aggregation of investing cash inflows and outflows by customer type or other risk characteristics. For example, new customers versus existing, performing versus non-performing loans. Moving on to intangible assets. For internally generated intangible assets, we do not want to see more capitalization. For goodwill, most of our analysts do not believe amortization is an improvement, and therefore a change is not justified in our view. We predict goodwill amortization will likely be another non-GAAP adjustment. We, we're also concerned that we might lose use for information such as the current sensitivity disclosure. On a more general, general note, an objective of disclosure or disaggregation is to help investors understand the ongoing effect, in this case, charges related to intangible assets. In situations where other is the biggest item, the objective is not achieved. Some companies aggregate amortization and impairment charges. Again, this is not helpful. We understand cryptocurrency is an emerging issue. Although it is not yet part of our day-to-day um, -day work, we would uh, welcome more disclosure, especially regarding the accounting treatment and risks. To the extent that there are readily observable um, market prices, fair value disclosure would be helpful. The last potential project we want to comment on today is cost of sales. We'd like to see improved disclosure on three items inventory provisions, product warranty provisions, and variable considerations. For all of these, we would like a roll forward disclosure. In addition, there should be a requirement to present product warranty charges in cost of goods sold. Lastly, we support efforts to remove any uh, conceptual inconsistencies between the recognition of cost of sales and the principles in IFRS 15, the revenue recognition guidance. Overall, we believe enhanced disclosure and more timely disclosure that interim as well as annual can go a long way in improving the usefulness of financial reports. I'm going to end with a couple of disclosure examples to show that a general requirement for disclosure without specifying the manner or the format may not be sufficient to obtain the intended outcome. The first example relates to inventory allowance. In 2020, additions and reversals totaling minus 5,939 were recorded for value adjustments. We couldn't determine if the negative amount represents a charge or a gain from reversals. In the second example, receivables factoring, the roll forward along with the footnotes um, makes it clear what is the cash flow benefit and there is no confusion what's the ending balance versus the amount factored during the period. I'm going to hand the call over to my colleague Giles for Q&A. Thank you, Jen. Um, so as I said at the beginning here, we, we've got the option on the, the panel here that they go to webinar for chat functions. So if you have any questions, we've got some already, but if you do want to put your question in, just type it in uh, and we will try and get to it. Um, as we go through the questions. So and if you don't have time or no facilities to do that, then you can ask questions. Obviously, uh, as I said, we will get back to questions post the webinar as well. So to the first question, uh, the question is, uh, what was the mixed feedback the board received related to the difference between acquired and internally generated intangible assets? It seems to be a lot of overlap between this question, particularly in, in uh, definitive live lived at intangibles versus oh, intangibles other than goodwill and the goodwill question. So uh, I think that's one for, for the board and to, to go and Zach. Over to you, Zach. Sure. Um, so maybe I'll start by agreeing with the last point, which is there. there's a ton of overlap between this question and even the question on acquired intangibles and indefinite lived intangibles. And so that's 
something we're actually grappling with right now in our business combinations project. Uh, one of the key questions we had for investors and stakeholders was whether there was value in some of these indefinite lived intangibles being presented separately from Goodwill. Um, and the, the preliminary feedback we got on that was that most respondents liked to see them separated out, particularly on the investor side. Um, now, on the difference between acquired and internally, internally generated intangible assets, I would say the mixed portion is that everyone agrees that conceptually you don't want to see a difference between uh, intangible assets that are developed internally and those that are acquired. Um, but it becomes a little bit more problematic when you start thinking about solutions to that. Um, fair value accounting developed the concept of acquired and tangible assets um, from business combinations. And that's most of what we see if, as investors. Um, and the market has moved in how they handle those quite a bit. And so, trying to keep up with that and realizing that a lot of companies are now non-gapping those things out. Um, how we as users process them is mixed in and of itself. So it begins to color the last part, which is well, what do you do to narrow the difference? And um, clearly one of the solutions is you don't have acquired intangibles anymore. Um, but I think very few people would agree with that side of the equation. The other is, do you begin building up or creating new intangible assets that are generated internally? And that's where the feedback has been extremely mis mixed. How do you do that exactly is the problem. Do you take the costs that you have and capitalize them? Um, do you have a valuation every quarter? of what you think your human capital is worth, what you think your brand is worth. Um, and you can see where people begin to respond very negatively to things like that very quickly as you kind of move down the spectrum. Um, so that I would say that's the that's how the feedback was characterized as mixed is um, there's just a lot of different opinions on what should appear on the balance sheet, what should flow through the profit and loss statement. Um, and it's very hard to get to a common ground. Okay, thank you, Zach. Um, we've got another question for the board. So in the wake of Green Seal, Carillion and Abengoa, will the board be revisiting the disclosure or lack of the respect to supplier financing arrangements? In a perfect world, what would investors know about these arrangements? Um, so I can answer the first part of the question pretty easily. So the the IFRIC, uh, which is the Interpretations Committee of the IFRS Foundation, um, did make an agenda decision on supply chain finance issues, uh, which I'll shorten their decision quite a bit by saying that they felt that the current accounting standards handled supply chain finance adequately. And so they merely clarified what those requirements are and how people should view them. Uh, the second part of what they did though, was recommend that the board take up a narrow scope project, looking exactly at the issue of disclosure. Um, and so we, we are doing that. We are um, beginning to research it. I don't think we have put anything on the formal work plan yet, um, but you always need to understand all the issues before you go about doing that. And so we're in that research phase. Um, I can't answer for the board and what they believe investors should know about those arrangements. We haven't talked about it as a group. Um, but in my view, the key pieces of information are knowing what's owed to suppliers, what's owed to the banks at any given point in time, and how those transactions have affected the cash flow statement. And so on the cash flow statement, you have the issue of operating cash flows, which are essentially uh, affected by the change period to period in what's outstanding in terms of reverse factoring, to just use one term associated with that. Uh, and then you have sort of this confluence between operating cash flows and financing cash flows. Because if 
payables are transferred between trade payables and financing payables. Um, the agenda decision was that that is a non-cash transfer. And so in most cases, it would be appropriate for the outflows to come through financing and the inflows to come through operating cash flow. Um, for investors, what that does though is really mess up your free cash flow definition. Um, so for me, understanding what that non-cash transfer was in any given period is essential because that's how much your free cash flow is going to be overstated. Okay, thank you, Zach. Um, so another question uh, we've got here. Uh, the implementation uh, of IFRS 15 seemed costly for preparers. What is the feedback on the success and how is it measured of that standard and, uh, as it might directly impact how or whether the inventory or cost of sales project is prioritized? So in terms of the agenda consultation, the answer to the to that one is um, unfortunate. Um, so we've had IFRS 15 and the US GAAP equivalent outstanding for a few years now, um, but we typically start what we call a post-implementation review uh, two to three years after the standard has been issued. And so that hasn't started yet. Um, I mentioned it earlier that it's upcoming and we will be doing that and it'll give us the feedback and the answers to those questions. What we do have now is clearly feedback we've gotten already from preparers and from users because we're talking to both. And I would also note that the FASB actually starts their post implementation review uh, much earlier because what we call just research preparing for the post implementation review is essentially part of their post implementation review. So we'll be able to take all of that preliminary feedback uh, and understand what worked well and what didn't and hopefully apply it to the uh, cost of sales project. Okay, thank you. Um, got another question here. Um, if the IASB intends to tackle cash flow and related matters, uh, would it look to, to further converge with US GAAP? Interest costs paid as well as lease payments are often buried in the IFRS, making comparisons across the globe more difficult. What about free cash flow or other KPI reconciliations? Okay, so there's there's like three projects rolled into that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> and maybe maybe I'll go with the first one. If if we do in tackle cash flows, um, convergence is something that we're always going to look to have an understanding of what's going on in U.S. GAAP. Um, and where we can help it, we, we don't want to differ. I mean, that creates costs for everyone. Um, but if the feedback we get on a particular issue is that stakeholders in an international context really want information presented differently than what the U.S. is doing, um, then we likely won't have convergence because you want to get to the right accounting answer. Um, in terms of the individual line items and where they are, um, we're working on, in addition to the cash flow project that we'd have out into the future, we're working right now on what we call our primary financial statements projects, which is we're trying to create more structure to the P&L in IFRS reporting. And so we're kind of systematically going through the structure. We've created a new, or the project would create a new operating profit subtotal, as well as a subtotal um, after investing activities, uh, and then finally one that comes after financing activities as well. And so that would move around and create more consistency in what goes where on the P&L. In terms of the um, cash flow statement, those would probably come in a cash flow project. Um, and where those get assigned as well. Some of them might be handled in the PFS, Primary Financial Statements Project, um, but not all. Others would have to wait for the cash flow because the PFS really does focus on the P&L first and foremost. Um, the, uh, except for 
I should say interest payments, uh, which is one of the areas that is being moved in or standardized in IFRS. Right now, there's a choice of where you put interest payments and those would be moved down to the financing cash flow segment. Um, KPIs, I think, was the last part of the question. Um, yep. On those, that's actually coming in through our PFS project. So one of the things that the PFS project did was to create for the first time or suggest that we create uh, a segment of the financial statements where management could present what we call management performance measures, which in our disclosure or in our exposure draft um, was primarily around um, KPIs that related to the profit and loss statement. Um, interestingly, one of the pieces of feedback we got was that a lot of preparers, a lot of users would prefer that we actually handle a much wider universe of KPIs, um, non-GAAP adjustments, whatever you want to call them, in that. So that's what we're working on right now is determining, are we going to keep the original scope um, or do we think we can make some changes and expand it? Uh, it's never easy to tweak things after. Um, and come out with a final rule, <clears throat> but we're gonna we're gonna see what we can do there. Um, and there is the possibility that things like free cash flow could end up with a reconciliation as part of that if companies use it as a performance measure, because it's not defined under IFRS standards. Okay, thank you, Zach. Um, thank for the input there, and thank you, Jen, as well. Uh, we're now up on time uh, just beyond we were planning to go to quarter to the hour so uh thank you everyone's time um as i said again please pose questions any further questions we can get to afterwards please send them over we will send a, a copy of the, the this uh webinar over to you as well so please uh come back with any questions and uh, we'll answer those in due time so thank you very much for your time um uh, and we'll end there thank you <laughs>